If you have questions about life and the meaning of your existence, you're in the right place. You're now entering the realm of normals talking paranormals. Welcome to Mythos Travelers. Welcome to Mythos Travelers. I am Greg Lawson, also known as The Paranormal Detective. You can find me at theparanormaldetective.com. And I am Sean Freddy, also known as Sean Freddy. We are just a couple of normals talking paranormals. Let's start off with what we're going to do in this show. I, I know you got interested in myth when you were pretty young, right? Yeah, yeah. I was, and a lot of it was like around Star Wars, because I'm a huge Star Wars junkie. And once I found out that Lucas had been a, a student of Joseph Campbell, I looked into his work in comparative mythology, and that like heavily influenced the, the original trilogy. And anybody that knows me knows I go down wormholes, so I just spiraled out of control on mythology. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about Joseph Campbell. I don't know anything about him. Oh, he was a brilliant man, and his big field of study was comparative mythology. He's written uh, many books, and one of the classics is called Hero with a Thousand Faces. His comparative mythology influenced Star Wars, and, and in the book... Luke Skywalker is actually mentioned in the book by Joseph Campbell about the hero's journey and all the similarities between all the different cultures and societies. Cool. Yeah, that kind of leads us to that uh, monomyth of it seems like in every culture, the hero's journey is kind of the same thing. You yeah, know? you have a lot of the, the heroes where they didn't know that they were special. They, they grew up plain or mundane, and then they found out there was something special about them. They're guided by some kind of a wizard or a witch or a supernatural entity that helps train them and guide them through. And then, you know, sometimes you have the character of the rogue and you've got a bad guy that has to be fought. It's all like pretty simple stuff. Yeah, I've looked at a lot of different, whether it's in Marvel comics or whether it's in movies, it seems like there's that, that whole, you know, the, the individual, the, the world is normal. And then there's some sort of, thing that they're going to chase or they're, they're called to to come help or do something and there's there's always reluctance on their part to do it and then like you said then there's that that wizard or that that mentor that comes in and kind of guides them along yeah like a like a merlin to king arthur yeah, yeah you know that obi-wan kenobi did exactly yeah. that yeah. leads them leads them down that path well, that, that's the thing that, that fascinates me is how many different cultures there are out there, but how similar we really are. You can look at some of the Hindu stuff, and it's way out there. I mean, they, they get very, very deep. But if you, if you look across, it's, it's, it, it, I believe in that monomyth. I believe in that kind of standard procedure, I guess, that they go through. Well, and, yeah, and a lot of them, like, like the story, uh, I, mean, I mean, you'll see that in the Greek mythologies, uh, uh, where like a lot of the Greek heroes didn't realize that they were special, basically. You know, Zeus came down, shagged somebody, had a demigod son. Demigod son did not know he was a demigod and then went on to do great things. But the Greeks... Uh, uh, their stories never ended well. I, I, the only one I can think of in the hero cycle that ever ended well was Bellerophon. All the rest of them died due to their own hubris. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and that's the other thing on the the whole demigod side. You know, when your uh, uh, when your father is a god, I would assume that would influence you in some way. That when you once you figure that out, and it probably wouldn't be good. I don't know. Uh, probably, you know. You know, maybe Heracles had abandonment issues. I'm not sure. In this particular show, Sean and I are going to cover a large area, a very wide swath of myths and legends. And we're going to look at it as it relates to our culture, our society, and how it influences not only the scientific names we give to things, but it also influences movies, uh, music, culture, every, every literature, opera. I mean, everything. So the Greeks, they're probably the most studied of any of the mythos. Would you would you think? Yeah, I think most people are at least have a passing familiarity with with uh, with the Greek gods and, and their stories. But yeah, you start digging into it and, and there's so many different stories that are like that it, it should be the same story but there's different interpretations or you know different stories about the same events 
Right. You know, it's it's not entirely homogenous. It's it's interesting to me on how in most of these things how flawed everyone is. Even the gods. I mean, you know, they're they're married but they're cheating on each other and they're trying oh, yeah. to kill off their siblings and, yeah, the, and just the whole bit. They're vain. They're self-centered. Uh, I mean, they're, basically, they're just like crappy people with superpowers. That's what it seems like, you know. I, I you know, Depending on whether you, uh, you know, read about it or you watch films, everybody has a little bit different interpretation on a lot of that stuff. But it's, um, it's pretty interesting on how that mythos is more like human beings as opposed to let's say a christian kind of mythos when you're talking about angels or demons or or something like that it's kind of cut and dry you're either kind of a good guy or you're a bad guy right you know they're very separated from humanity but and, but a lot of the the old religions uh, mythologies the uh yeah the gods were just like i mean very flawed i yeah. mean i mean not exactly. Some of these people are like, I don't think I want to have them over for dinner. I don't think I like them that much. <laughs> right. Well, and, and that's the thing is, is I'm, I'm wondering when all of this was brought forward. The, th the thing about myth is when, when somebody talks about myth, you immediately in the back of your mind think about false or fake or lie or not true. And that's something that, that I think that people overlook of what the myth served. What, what was the purpose because I firmly believe that one person's myth is another person's divine truth. As it, we could get into the burning bush and Moses' trip to the, you know, Mount well, Sinai. And, and, you know, religion and mythology, you, which, you know, the only difference in between mythology and religion is followers. You know, <laughs> that's every, everything right, yeah. that's a mythology now once was a religion. But, uh, I mean, it was, it was a way for people to explain the natural world when they didn't really have science to explain it. And it was also to give them guidelines. Uh, uh, a while back, I was watching the uh, comedian Louis Black. You know, he comes from a Jewish background. He was talking about the Old Testament. He's like, he's like, no, you know, the, the, the Jews needed rules. He's like, you know, we were like three hairs away from being, you know, baboons. It's, you know, <laughs> something needed to keep us in line. Right. You know, and, and fear of the divine is what kept people in line. And that's true today. I mean, that you, you meet people every day that in their mind of whatever religion that they follow, they absolutely try to do the right thing or try not to do the wrong thing based on that as opposed to just being a good person yeah yeah it's it's, it's you know it, that instead of just being you know an intrinsically good person it's you know yeah i believe a lot of not i don't know what the percentage is but people act as like i need to be good because i don't want to go to the bad place not, right. be, not because being good is just the right thing to do yeah and in each person i think that it's that belief that changes it from what is divine truth to you is a myth to me i mean you can you can look at all of that you you can look at uh, just in the like you say the christian religion but like muslim and jewish also those traditions are all interwoven right and there's so many like interpretations of all the major religions i mean even christianity is not homogenous you know i mean all the different you know protestant faiths as well as like you know, you've got the Catholic, then you've got the Eastern Orthodox. It's like, and they, their Bibles are not the same. They right. have different books. You know, the the um, Ethiopian Orthodox Church has, I think it's the only Bible that has the Book of Enoch in it. That's con to the rest of them. That's considered which is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is you know, you know, it's one of the apocryphal books. I, I think it's still part of the the apocryphal or pseudo epigraphical books uh, recognized by the catholic church but like the you know the protestants are like nope nope if it's not in the bible it doesn't count right right and and it's yeah so y you follow stuff like that you know and somebody i, I, I was talking to letter day saint, saint the other day and we were talking about finding the golden plates that's his divine truth that's that's one of the things the, the, one of the foundations of what happened in their religion to create the mormon religion other people will roll their eyes and go what okay where are the plates well they were hidden again i mean and how is that like any wackier than any other supernatural it's story it's not it's just recent and and there's a lot of people that believe in divine intervention and and uh, the holy spirit but they kind of believe that it kind of stopped you know the the last the last prophets it's just kind of stopped but after that the muslims came forward and they had their prophet 
And, it, and if you look at Muhammad's ride to heaven, that's a divine truth to a Muslim. Well, and it's like you, you pointed out, like a lot of people think it stops because like along with the topic of this show with the, you know, it, it, the influence of of, uh, of myth and religion and folklore on society and our entertainment. So over the last few years, just think about like how many like movies and TV shows where part of the premise was God's gone, like right. he's checked out, he, he's he's just not participating, and people are trying to find God or you know somebody's trying to step in and take his place, uh, and you know which leads to like a class war amongst the angels and the demons all over again. Yeah. And, and that's something that's always fascinated me because I, I was raised Catholic um, and I always do the joke that, that I'm a recovering Catholic. But, you know, I mean, I was I was inculcated. I was ingrained in a belief system that is very strange to a Protestant to, you know, to think that, we, you know, we potentially pray to saints. We do these other religious rites. We absolutely believe, I say we it's people other than me (laughs) Uh, but as a catholic if you're a true catholic you believe in transubstantiation you believe the mystery of the eucharist when that priest prays over that bread and prays over that wine it becomes the body and blood of jesus christ and and that practice is it's like thousands and thousands of years older than christianity i mean that was part of ancient religious right and it's still part of like uh, if you want to call it modern but ritual magic yeah i mean it's a similar it's they're doing the same thing they are and that's the thing that kind of confuses me because i know a lot of catholics and i bring that up to them and they said no 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 that's just symbolic that's that's symbolic I'm like, not if you're Catholic. Uh, yeah. And if from, you're Catholic, you have to, that's divine truth. You have to believe that or else you're not a Catholic. You can call yourself something else. And my dad came from a Catholic family and my mom from, you know, Baptist family. Neither one of them, like, I did not grow up going to church. Uh, my mom does not like preachers. She doesn't like churches. She doesn't think she needs anything between her and God. My dad's more of kind of a, an animist, animistic kind of guy. He, you know, if you were to ask him, it's like, where's your church? He's like, he'll tell you. He's like, when he's in the mountains. Yeah, that that's his place. So I didn't grow up with any religion. So you grew up Catholic. I grew up with that person who's always on the outside looking in going like this is all kind of weird to me. I mean, uh, like, I think I've been like one church service my adult life. And it was a very strange experience to me because I just I was like, I don't get this. They're like, turn to your neighbor and say the magic words, which is like, you know, peace be with you or whatever. I, I, right, I go, right. I don't I don't know the secret handshake, guys. I'm just passing through. Yeah. And so that that's the interesting thing about the whole paranormal perspective on the world. People will I, I'll, I'll talk to people about paranormal stuff. They'll ask me, so what, what is this that you do? You're a ghost hunter? I'm like, well, no, I'm a, I'm a paranormal researcher. I'm a paranormal explorer. And I write about it. And that's that's kind of the core. I do investigations in places that are claimed to be haunted. I do that just because I'm looking for the experience. I'm that I'm that scientific materialist that wants evidence and I want some example. But there's also this other side of me that's kind of trying to convince myself maybe that's not what it is. Maybe we can't find physical evidence of paranormal because obviously if you're looking for paranormal and you're you're using normal means to do it in other words you're you're using video and you're using uh, you know some sort of recording device audio recording device or you're using some sort of gadget that picks up electromagnetic frequency changes or disruptions or whatever well that's all normal but you're looking for paranormal how does that work we don't we don't have the devices (laughs) <laughs> to, to register the paranormal because we don't know what we're supposed to be measuring in the first place. That's right. And that's that's what I say to people. Some people use these ghost detectors, which are electromagnetic frequency detectors, as ghost detectors. And they actually walk around and try to find a ghost with it. I, my whole confusion is, is how do you know that that's a ghost? Because if we had a ghost and we had him here, we could do <laughs> experiments and go, okay, yes. He yeah, well, we, we could do like yeah, repeatable scientific experiments. Right. He, he disrupts this electromagnetic field. And then I go, OK, though, that that shows that that's a ghost. But typically what it shows me is that there's an uh, electrical conduit in the wall or there's a light with a, a fluorescent light with a ballast on it. Or something yeah, like there's that. there's some other you know physical aberration right. in the environments. Because like you said, it's like we 
we don't like you know we don't like do the controlled studies we're like all right you know we've got five five ghosts on this side five ghosts on this side we're giving these ghosts the placebo and then we're giving these <laughs> ghosts the real thing and then we're going to see how this affects them right what we have today there's no way for us to do that that's why i kind of fall back on maybe it's something else maybe these experiences that people have are actually from something being human now, a psychologist or psychiatrist or a therapist would tell you it's part of your cognitive build, it's part of your personality, uh, and it's also a mistake of sensory perception. You see something, you think it's a ghost, or you hear something, you think it's the voice of someone from another universe or something, and these things happen. And contemporary medical personnel and, and, and people that study psychology will tell you that it's all in your head. It's just that your brain is just doing this to you. Yeah. But what if it's not? What if it is something else? Because I, I don't know what the percentage are, but I think a majority of the people on the earth believe in some sort of God. Right. And, and I'm very, I, you know, I was, I was a detective for eight years. You know, that was the last of my, my law enforcement career. So I am very, like, evidence and fact-based in, in the way that I view the world. But at the same time, and you and I have spoken before, it's like, I've seen some weird shit. It's like, I don't have an answer for it. Uh, I wish I did, but, you know, I don't have that special tool that's going to measure what I just saw. Yeah. People ask me, you know, so you see ghosts, you hear voices, you hear this. It's like, uh, no, I have to say no where I currently work. If they find out that I'm <laughs> hearing voices or seeing things, uh, I'm going to be at the psychologist. And, I'm, you know, you... So the uh, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, right? I hate that yeah. How test. many times have you taken that test? Five or six times. Yeah, me too. You know, if, if you don't know what it is, it's, it's a 500 or 600 question test you take to measure your personality and whether or not you're kind of a stable person. So, yeah, I don't know whether it necessarily well, and, does that and, job. But. And it asks you a lot of the same questions over and over and over again, but in a different manner. Like, and you'll remember this from the test, like, do you love your mother? Yeah. You know, 20 questions later, it's like, how do you feel about your mother? And one of the questions was like, I hate her. Or I love her. It's like, it'll ask you a hundred times. Like, do you love your mother? Right. So if you say that you see things in that test or you hear things in that test, you're going to lose points. <laughs> you know, it, <laughs> it automatically takes away from you. But th that's my whole argument is, you know, it, it's funny. I'll, I'll talk to a Catholic and somehow it'll come up and I'll say, yeah, I do paranormal investigations. And they, then they roll their eyes at me. I'm like, oh, OK. I'm like, wait a second. It's like, don't you like candles <laughs> in the church? Right. Don't you pray to the saints? Don't you, you know, uh, do the rosary? Don't do I me. Mean, I was like, doesn't the Holy See have like relics that are blessed? Hello. So I look at all that stuff and, and I wonder whether there is something to it, but it is truly a human Thing. It is some sort of connection that we have with our brains or our spirit or whatever it is that provides for these unusual experiences. Because you and I have talked about this before. I don't have any visual experiences that would tell me that, you know, there's a ghost there. Uh, I haven't I haven't seen a ghost. I've seen things out of the corner of my eye that were very unusual and I look to see what it is and it's gone. And I've had like the the one big one was like I looked right I mean it looked like a middle aged man in a hallway and looked right at him. Yeah, what what happened with that? Tell me that story. Oh I was oh man, what was I like late teens, early twenties and the girl I was dating I'd been invited over for dinner. It was her and her mom, you know, lived in a house. And we're just hanging out in the front, you know, front room and I looked down the hallway to where all the bedrooms and the bathroom were. And, of course, all the lights were off down there. And we were just chatting and having a nice time. And I saw a guy standing there. I thought it was just a, a friend of the mom. And we keep talking. And I was like, well, that's kind of weird. It's like, if he was, like, going to the bathroom, why hasn't he come up yet? And so I asked him. I was like, oh, well, what's up with your with your friend back there? And they exchanged looks and then looked at me. And they're like, there's nobody back there. And I was like, Oh, yes, there was. And they go, no, there isn't. So I jumped up because you know, I thought like maybe an intruder. And I, you know, like, oh, okay, there's nobody back there. And then they told me the house was haunted. I'm like, no. And they're like, yeah, no, it's it's haunted. You know, it was like in the past, like this guy, you know, it was a single father, like killed his children and then committed suicide. So then I was like, oh, crap, I'm looking under every bed in the closet. <laughs> it's like, I go, I want to find this thing. Cause like I looked right at it. You know, you know, and it was what, what some people would call it a ghost. I don't know what it was. But I know I saw something because, I mean, we made eye contact. Wow. 
Yeah, and and that that you know you go down that rabbit trail on. Um, you know, is it a ghost that is aware that it's a ghost and he's there, or is it a psychic impression of some sort, a residual yeah. haunting? Is it, is it just a piece of film playing, you know, over, over and over? Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's, it's, it's the life equivalent of a GIF that just keeps recycling over and over and over. Right. Or is it a time traveler, is somehow, you know, dimensional being that's doing, you know, I mean, it's, there's, there's I don't know about the whole time travel things. thing, because, you, know, yeah. uh, you know, Stephen Hawking threw a party for time travelers. And nobody showed up. He didn't tell anybody about it because he his he postulates like he goes, well, they'll know about it in the future. So they'll show up. Ah, he was the only one with the party had at the time traveler party. Nice. <laughs> that's a good experiment. <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. The experiences that I've had have just been very emotional experiences, which a lot of people can get when they do religious rite or passage kind of thing. They can they can you know, have this very profound experience. Right, yeah, because, I mean, well, all throughout, like, human history, there, there's the, the rituals, uh, uh, you know, the people give themselves over. I mean, and some of them are, are well, you take, like, uh, Plains Indians, like the Ghost Dance or Sweat Lodge. I mean, right. I mean, th these are basically endurance trials to alter your state. Yeah, and, it, uh, and, it's, and it's obvious when you put somebody through something very physical and the, the fatigue sets in and, you know, the confusion of their brain and hallucinations and all kinds well, of stuff. Well, and, you know, you're, you're, you're former military, so I'm pretty sure at some point in your training, you were so fatigued and exhausted and lack of sleep that the world got weird. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, uh, I can assure you that that happened. So the cool thing with talking with you is that you have experience in Alaska. You've, you've been to Alaska. I was stationed up in Alaska for a while while I was in the Army, and I had a really profound experience when I was in Alaska. Um, I was going through a school in Kodiak, Alaska, and doing a lot of swimming. And so I, I was in and out of the water every day in that kind of water. We were wearing, uh, wearing dry suits. So we were doing a lot of scuba diving training, rescue training, that kind of thing. And on our last day was Friday, and I didn't have to be back to Fort Rich until Monday. So I had done some, a little bit of research, and I wanted to go to Three Saints Bay, which is the first Russian outpost that they had in Alaska. And so I got a, an Alaskan Uber, which is, you know, a Cessna at some <laughs> little, little uh, dirt runway, and, uh, and got him to give me a ride over to Three Saints Bay. Three Saints Bay actually got relocated to what's called Old Harbor. And Old Harbor is, it has an old, it's the most bizarre place. Um, we, we land, and I have to walk to town, which is maybe about a mile, I don't know, half a mile, a mile. On my way into town, I see this crazy dome, and I realize it's a Russian Orthodox church. And it's in Alaska in the middle of, I mean. Oh, every, yeah. yeah. If, if you weren't, weren't used to it, there's, you know, the Russian Orthodox churches are everywhere, and they have, like, the coolest cemeteries because yeah. they, they build little houses over every grave to, to protect the souls. It's crazy. I mean, it, and I say crazy. It's just interesting. It, it's such a contrast to what you're expecting in Alaska. And then all of a sudden there's this big blue dome. Anyway, I, I went there, and uh, I wanted to go over to sit Kaladak Island it's it's right across the bay and there's a place called Refuge Rock and that's basically the wounded knee of Alaska the uh, Russians cornered the Aleut people and they went to Refuge Rock which is a big rock that just sticks out uh, in the ocean and it's hard to get to well they weren't used to dealing with Russian and with cannon so they all got on Refuge Rock and the Russians just did crossfire on them they killed for sure 300 if not 3,000 and there was a uh, Dutch anthropologist that actually came there in the early 1800s and interviewed some of the people that actually survived the massacre. And they told about how mothers were taking their children and throwing them off the cliff into the into the sea so that the Russians Jeez. couldn't get them. Yeah, because they were they were taking them as slaves. When I went there, I had a profound experience while I was there, just sitting on the beach and 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 looking at the rock. The rock was about 300 yards off of the beach. But I, it's something that I can't even explain. No, I've, I've been to some places in the world, and I, the same feeling. It's You're there, and you whisper. You're not in a library, but whoever it is, like the, you just have this feeling of awe and reverence. You're like, well, like uh, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be loud here. Uh, I shouldn't be an ass. It's like, we should probably whisper when we're here. It's like, but there's no one around. Who are we going to disturb? Right. But you just feel that, and, and I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, 
probably never will actually know what it is, but it, it happens. And that is where I kind of merge my scientific side to, hey, maybe it is something different. It might be just uh, a natural thing that that's what human beings do when they uh, they get into an area that maybe overstimulates you. you know, there are so you know with religion and folklore, the, you know, all this tie in. If you if you like the Japanese Shinto, there are places that have kami. They have their own spirits, and these are natural places. And you'll find uh, the gates that the, the torii that they put up, where it's called a gate, but uh, yeah, it's just this wooden thing you can walk through. And it's put up at these special places because somewhere, somebody who was a Shinto was at that place and said, there's something special about this. And there's special places. Oh, what is it? The uh, the big cathedral in, um, I think it's at Chat, France. You know, the cathedral's been there for, what, hundreds and hundreds of years. Before that, it was a pagan holy site. It was like, that's been a holy site for a long time. Right. So what it, makes that place special? Yeah, and there's a, a, a lot of contemporary religious sites now that were. Old, well, old, old holy sites. And I, and I know some, like, you know, religious sites, it's like, meh, we took over. We're going to burn your place to the ground, and just to be asses, we're going to build our church on top of it or our holy right. site. But a lot of it, ha- I mean, there is like, I go, no, there's something special about this place. You know, we're, yeah. it's like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to start building here because this place is special without maybe even knowing that, well, you know, there was another temple here long before you showed up. It's all gone now, but another society thought that this place was special too. Right. You look at that and then, then it, it, you, you fall back on, well, are they ley lines? Is that, is that something special about spirituality at this particular location or is it the magnetosphere is very concentrated in, in, in certain spots that are making it special and, and have that, that feeling, uh, that, I mean, and yeah, there's some place like you saw Denali, you went to the mountain and that's an easy one. You're like, wow, that's big. That is impressive. I mean, that is the largest mountain in North America. It's huge from bottom to top. Denali is actually bigger than Everest. Everest just sits on a high appeal, but it's impressive. I mean, it's, it's awe inspiring. Well, and that's something that I tend to do is when I do paranormal exploration, most of the time uh, my wife is with me or I'm with a couple of other people. But where I get my real experience is when I'm alone. When I was in Alaska, our company got pulled to do a hike on McKinley and actually do Denali. I wanted to go, but I had just gotten stationed up there and I wasn't chosen. And I was mad because I'm spoiled and I should have gone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I, I just hadn't been there long enough. And so I ended up taking two weeks leave later that summer, and I went and I soloed the cathedral mountain range beside it. The cathedrals kind of circle around Denali, and it was incredible. I didn't have the refuge rock experience. I didn't have any real profound experience, but it was just liberating, I guess. And some of, like, some of the feelings are different. A few years ago, I was in England, we went to Stonehenge, and I was with uh, some friends, and one of the friends, it was a couple, and they had their little five-year-old and the daughter. And there's these two really big, there's a lot of barrows all around that area, you know, but there was like two really big ones that were close by. And there's a little trail, and we'd walked around, and one of my friends and, and her little girl was sitting down with the, uh, with the other friend that had gone with us. And they were sitting between these two, I mean, they're almost like two-story tall, you know, barrows. Mm-hmm. And it's just idyllic. It's like grassy, and they're sitting in the grass and the flowers. And I was like, well, and they're, they're talking quietly. And I walked over and I sat down with them. But as soon as I sat down, I went, oh. And then they both looked at me and said, yeah, okay. Like, you feel it too. I'm like, yeah, there's just like something like, once again, it's like, we're in the library. We have to be respectful, you know. And But it was like a, a happy, calm feeling just to sit there. I was like, I don't know why. But when they looked at me and saw my face, they're like, oh, yeah, you feel it too, don't you? <laughs> so right. like all three of us were having this weird shared experience. But what causes it? Right. And so that's what myth and uh, paranormal and everything, it seems like that myth, paranormal, all of these experiences that people have are the main things that shape our culture and, and our, um, our society. But that's just my opinion on that. So we're going to wrap it up for our first show. The second show will be covering Greek mythology, and uh, we'll dabble off into the Norse also. So this is Greg Lawson. And this is Sean Freddy. And we look forward, what do we look forward to? Oh, God, I don't know. Sean Brady. And we want to pump you up. 